again. All you, all you gotta do is turn this thing on. Put the oh, not that. There we go. All right. Put that on for like 20 minutes. Whatever it takes to boil. Oh, hey, can you get that? Uh, uh, shove up. Get that stuff. Okay. Get, get, bring that over here. There you go. Got it. Yeah, I'm liking the sound of that. You know, I was, I was at the store. Yeah, the store you left to go to like 12 hours ago, 13, 13 hours ago. Did you at least get the sour cream? Um. Phil, I can see the money sticking out of your hat. It isn't the amount you left with, so you spent it on something. Just down the block. We couldn't just get the stuff we needed. What the hell happened? Okay, so it's like 10 in the morning, right? I go to leave the store. As soon as I walk out the front door, right across the street, sleazy pee. I don't want to get wrapped up in whatever get rich quick crypto scheme he's got going this weekend. That's fine, I'll just cross the street further down. So I hit the sidewalk, I turn right, and who do I turn into? Rick, the, the neighbor, and uh, former neighbor. You know, he's moving out to the burbs. He was back in the city to get more of his stuff. Now that I think about it, why didn't he just pay for the movers down the street? definitely has the money to do so now. No idea. Either way, he stops me and we get to talking. He says it's good to see me again. I ask him how many more weekends he's going to keep coming back in the city to slowly move out of the stuff. He says he figures he's got like three more weeks. I asked him if he got anyone to buy that part of the duplex yet. He says... Nah, but he doesn't really need to look. The sign in the yard and the postings on the net do enough advertising for him. He's had a few calls, some things are moving forward, but the housing market the way it is, he's not really sure any of them are going to see it through. At that, it seems like the small talk is over. Thank the gods. I start to move on, but he stops me again. He says he's met some of his newer neighbors. One of them reminds him of me. I'm like, oh, yeah? Who are they? He pauses, he's uh, clearly trying to think. Finally, he says he can't remember. But he'll get their name again the next time he sees them there, then tell me the next time he sees me here. Yeah. There's another pause in the conversation. This time he seems to edge towards the house, but I'm kind of dumbfounded, and I guess he could tell. He asked me what's the matter. I'm like, dude, you move into a whole new area and you don't even know your neighbor's name? He gets defensive. Says he does know the guy's name. Got the last time he was there, he just can't remember it now. I'm like, mate, everybody here then he interrupts me. Now he's getting mad and starts raising his voice. Tell me about how everyone here is trapped. Either stuck in a city they're not smart enough to go anywhere in. Or stuck in the cages built in their own heads. He says that everyone here is just dragging him down. That he's got a four year college degree. And he's not going to waste his life stuck in this area spinning his wheels. 
Then he starts pushing on me. I tried to move past him, but he kept blocking me, saying that if I were smart, if I had finished college, I'd be doing the same thing as him. Really wanted to deck him right then and there. Not sure what stopped me. The assault charges? That I proved him some form of right by doing that. Can't say I was really thinking at the time, but I figured Sleazy Pete would be better than this ass. Couldn't get past him, so just going across the street would have to do. He said some more bullshit as I was walking away. Something about running. Shit I wasn't paying any more attention to. I was seeing red. As I got across the street, Pete definitely saw me coming. I know I said he'd be better than this, but I did try to do a last second dodge around one of the parked cars, but he's too slick for that. Stop me just as I hit the sidewalk. I can still hear Dickbag shouting after me, so... Sleazy Pete. Starts trying to sell me on some kind of crypto e thing. He pulls it out from his puffer jacket's inner pocket. It's a cylinder-looking thing with a thick bottom. He explains it's got 5G tech built in to make sure connection is stable. Pete sells it as an easy way to quit smoking as each pop will cause a crypto coin. Um, filter coin, I think. And those coins don't come cheap. I had to remind Pete, I don't smoke. Well, not cigarettes anyway. I don't need that addiction in my life. Pete tells me he knows, but maybe I would know someone who does, who could. I guess it's Mac, but I don't want to get you roped into that. I told him I didn't. I lied. But I didn't move on. I couldn't hear him anymore, but I don't know if he had left. I guess I just wanted to try to flush that asshole's words out of my head, so I kept talking to Pete, asking him, how this thing even works? Like, what happens if you do lose internet connection? There are huge sections of the states without 5G. How are you gonna take a puff? Pete just kinda stared at me for a moment. He looked down at the e-cig. Finally said he doesn't know. He'll have to ask the manufacturer. Around then, we heard a car speed away from across the street, blaring its horn like a jackass. I asked Pete if he ever thought he was really going to hit one of these. I mean, none of these schemes ever really work out, not just for him, but in general. Pete then brought up Chet, the guy he says got him into all this. Uh, Chet was living on the block a couple years back. He got Pete into, into this stuff, selling Pete the same level of garbage Pete is hawking now. Pete says Chet hit the jackpot, the whole website set up someone was willing to pay a lot of money for. Chet cashed out and headed to the Upper East Side of the city. Pete still keeps up with Chet from time to time, initially just to try to get some tips from him, but by now, Chet's run out of money. I was kind of taken aback. Chet did move out. Wished us all well. I don't think there was any animosity to him moving up in the world. Even with all the get-rich-quick crap he tried to sell us all. But none of us ever really kept tabs on him. And that was probably the reason why. 
I figured he was doing plenty fine for himself. Guess not. Without information, I pointed out to Pete that's why he shouldn't be doing this. Pete just shrugged it off. Said Chet had made some mistakes with how he handled his money. Now he's sure to not make those mistakes. Everything will turn out fine for him. The confidence. Pete says one day he'll hit the jackpot and move out as well. I asked Pete, why does he do this? I mean, all these get rich quick schemes he keeps getting roped into. Does he enjoy it in some way? Pete says he can answer that one. He's got a wife and kid back at home. The wife makes all the money and plenty of it, to be fair. But Pete still wants to contribute something. Make sure his kid doesn't feel like he's just some bum. He tried the whole get a steady job thing. It didn't end well. Several times. Pete says if he can just hit one of these jackpots, one of these quick rich plays, then his wife wouldn't have to work as much. Or maybe at all. Yeah, I'm not going to lie, it's kind of sweet. And this is definitely the first time he's ever told me about that. Or... Maybe it was the first time I paid attention. After that, I felt like we understood each other a bit better. And I think Pete felt the same way. He didn't try to sell me on anything anymore. Finally, I told him I had to be moving on. Got things to do. Pete put out his hand and I fist bumped him back. He told me to watch myself out there. I told him I would. So I made it uh, two doors down. Then I see Vitaly sitting out there. Uh, he's the high school kid who built his own computer. Kid's pretty smart, but every day this dude wheels out this desk with a big screen TV and his gaming PC and a huge extension cord going back into the house and he sits out there and plays video games. <sighs> I guess it's better than just sitting inside and playing video games. He always wheels out a second chair too, puts another game controller on there in case anyone wants to join him. I think I've seen others do in the past. But today I saw something else out there. There was another table with a bin full of games. He said he was looking to sell them. He's a high school kid with a high school job. It doesn't exactly pay well. And he's now gaming on a PC. All the games he was selling were console games he no longer has a use for as he has almost every one of them on PC and in a better quality. I kind of poked through them. Then I saw what he was playing. Fortnite. In particular the um, no build mode. That is my shit. Pure skill. Mild bit of chaos. Checking my phone. It was only like 40 minutes since I had left. I had time. I probably didn't need to, but I asked if he was alright with me joining him. He said it was no problem. So I sat down, got set up, and hopped in. What a game, man. We started talking about it. What level of pass he was on. Strategies. Where it was best to hide and best to fight. Then the conversation steered towards more general talk about video games. I asked him why he games. He says he likes to see how people's minds work, react, uh, tick. 
what they do under pressured situations. <laughs> I didn't say it, but he definitely sees games differently than I do. I see like buildings and trees. He's damn near seeing the code. In the game, we were doing well. We were able to clear areas, take some time to actually look at the map, the buildings and structures. He started pointing out areas in the game that reminded him of areas throughout the city. In particular, a friend's place in Center City. My mind kind of wandered a bit. He seemed to notice me go quiet. He asked if everything was okay. It's unusual for me to even notice his play. I asked him. He grew up in the city, right? He said he did. I asked him if there was anything he would change about the city. He paused. I think we were sniped in the game then, but... He didn't seem to notice. He seemed wrapped up in his thoughts now. Finally, he said he, he doesn't know. He'll have to give that some serious thought. So, I asked him if he liked growing up in the city. He said he does. Couldn't imagine growing up in many other places. After that, he seemed a bit uncomfortable. Or maybe that was me. I apologize and we jump back into the next game. We finally won one and I decided to call it there. Well, I meant to. It took like three more games before I could finally pull myself away. But before I left, my eyes caught that bin of games again. I dug through them and found what I haven't played yet. He wanted ten bucks for it. Look, not a bad deal for a sixty dollar game to start, but I only brought fifteen. It wouldn't be enough to buy that and the sour cream. So I haggled back and forth with him until I could get him down to eight bucks. We had a deal, shook hands, and I went on my way so I made it a few doors down I'm moving at a good pace right then this parked car on the street opens its back driver's door but nobody got out I stopped something felt wrong I started moving up Slowly, as I got closer, I saw Arrow sitting in the back seat, waving me and telling me to hop in. I checked the front seats, there was nobody in them. He told me it was fine. I slowly got into the car, not really sure what this was all about. Not gonna lie, it kind of felt like a mafia movie. Once I was in the car, I turned to him to ask what was up, but he then leaned forward, reached across me. He grabbed the door and closed it. In a word, nervous. This was all so weird. Once he was settled back in, I asked him why he was in his car. It's summer. Arrow pointed at me, saying that's exactly why he's in the car. It's summer, and the AC in their place is broke. But the AC works fine in the car. I was 
so caught up in this whole strange setup that it wasn't until he said that that I realized it was nice in the car. Definitely better than it was out on the pavement. I asked him what he wanted. He said he'd rather know what I wanted. I didn't quite get what he meant. He said he saw me coming up in the rear view mirror and apparently I looked focused. Not like my usual self. I... didn't realize I was wearing it so obvious. I asked him if he remembered Jacques' Halloween party last year. He said he knew of it, heard some crazy shit went down, but didn't go himself. I told him I was there uh, before things got out of hand. I was just there, hanging with Rick, getting a few drinks in us. I miss hanging out with him like that. At that party, Rick told me he was proud of me. I had just gotten through community college, got an associate's degree. He said I had taken the first real step to bettering myself. I didn't think anything of that conversation at the time, just figured it was drunk Rick getting more sentimental. But now, I guess I should have seen the signs, even back then. There was a break in the conversation. I didn't know how to proceed, what to talk about next. Errol filled in the gap, asking me why I haven't gone the whole nine yards with the college thing. I don't really know kind of meant to, but by then I had just done two years of school after being away from that life for a while. I needed a break. I would say the break is meant to be a year long, but we're almost at a year now and I get the feeling I am not going to want to go back. The break is probably going to be a lot longer than that. The point being, Rick was cool back then. What the hell happened to him in less than a year? I didn't tell Errol what had happened earlier between us, but he seemed to pick it up all the same. He told me, friends today doesn't mean friends tomorrow. People grow, they shrink, they change, they drift apart. Either I've changed or Rick has changed, and we are no longer on the same wavelength. Or, probably, we've both changed, in little ways. And that was enough to cause a disconnect. I didn't realize it, but... Errol's a wise dude. I was floored by that statement. Errol, he only finished high school, right? Vitali hasn't even done that yet. Vitali's a smart kid. Errol's a wise dude. Rick's idea that he's better than any of these folks is really stupid. I wanted to continue on that conversation, but as I began to speak again, Errol's phone alarm started going off. I asked him what that was for. And he told me he kind of lied. My head immediately snapped to the front seats to look at them again. There was still nobody in them. Errol said there were actually two reasons he was out in his car. The broken AC was one of them. The other is his old lady doesn't like him smoking in the house. He says it sets the smell into the walls. He doesn't quite believe that, but... She's the boss. The alarm is to make sure he didn't miss that time. 
baking time. Arrow pulled some out, started packing it and rolling up. Dude has clearly been doing this for a while because even in the cramped space of his car, he didn't lose a single piece. Kind of masterful. In a quick motion, he pulled out a lighter and the pouch, pouch in the back of the front car seat lit it up. That smell filled the area quick. Good smell. He definitely has something more exotic than what we typically use. He took a drag and offered me. But I had to say no. I was still supposed to get the sour cream. Once he was settled back in, I tried to continue our conversation. Pushed on the topic of friends, current, and former, maybe how to get the formers back to current. But all you could come up with was offering them something they liked already, something I knew. Maybe. The philosophical side of Errol was gone. Who remained was now shallow as a puddle. Look. I know there's a time for that style of baking, but this wasn't one of them, at least not for me. When it became clear there was no way I was going to be able to continue that conversation in any meaningful way, I told Errol to hang tough and got out of the car. As soon as I got out of the car, closed the door. I turn right back onto the sidewalk and who do I see coming straight towards me? Sharice. Ah, oh, great. This is not what I need right now. I would have ducked behind the car or hid somewhere, but she already saw me looking straight at me, marching straight towards me. I tried to move towards the corner store, but she only needed to take a few more steps to be right on top of me. She asked me what I was up to. I continued moving to the store, telling her I was headed there. She turned around and started walking with me. We made it a few doors down, and she kept talking and asking questions about how my day's been and all that. Look. I know she's into me for some reason, but I just don't have the time right now for a relationship, or I guess then either. I kept moving and she stopped. She was looking in the chain link fence around the bottom of that old house they said would be fixed up and resold. They said that years ago, and yet there's been no movement beyond just putting the fence up to try to stop anyone from getting in. She said all this with a tone that I just can't place. Something between regret and mourning. So I stopped and Joined her by the fence. <laughs> I get the feeling the fence doesn't really work all too well. Even from the sidewalk, you could see paint tags all over the last few walls standing. Kids clearly get in there often and leave their mark. She started talking about old Thorpe. How he used to live there, how we used to Torment him. We were kind of asshole kids, huh? Poor guy died in the house. The house was supposed to go to one of his kids, but apparently they had moved out of the city ages ago and didn't bother coming back. So the house sat abandoned until it slowly fell apart and the 
pile of bricks and weeds it is today. She talked about how she used to hang out around this place. How we used to. I guess I was feeling depressed. I said I have no idea why anyone would want to hang out with me. Then or now. She straightened up and spun towards me looking angry. She said she wants to hang out with me because I got a good head on my shoulders. Yeah, sometimes it needs a little help focusing. But when I'm intent on something, there's nothing that can stop me. Wasn't what I was expecting to hear? It was really direct. I kind of shook it off, joked that she wasn't just hanging around me for my dashing good looks. She scoffed and turned back to the fence. Definitely not, she said. Jeez. One second a compliment, the next a hard smack in the face. We turned around and leaned back on the fence. Kept reminiscing about old times. High school, the block parties, popped hydrants on hot days. What's coming on? Who's coming going on the street? Good memories. She started shifting towards me. Touch my hand and I recoil. I shouldn't have. The look on her face. I just don't know what to do with all that. I don't want to give the wrong impression. She turned and looked down the street, said there was nothing more romantic than being together during the last drop of sunlight. Well, she's persistent, at least she's got that going for her. Not really sure if what she said about me was truly for me or her projecting her own focus on me. But then it hit me. Last drop of sunlight? I leaned forward, looking down the street as well. She was right. The sun had almost entirely set. I leapt off the fence, started moving towards the store, and she followed me. I told her I need to get moving, but to try to get her off of me. I said, we should hang out next week. She said, next Tuesday would be best for her. Not really sure what to say to that. I just said, uh, maybe. She stopped, looking at me with a skeptical face. She asked if this maybe was like February where we actually hung out or maybe like two months ago where I said I'd maybe join her in the park and then never showed. Left her hanging. Look, guys, I didn't leave her hanging on purpose. I just... Got caught up in other stuff. I couldn't give her an answer then. But I did manage to shake her off. I made it further. I could see the store. Then the garage attached to the house next to me opened up suddenly and I jumped a bit. Not really sure what was about to happen. It seems that whole situation in Errol's car still hadn't left me. A whole bunch of light flooded out on the street and I had to shield my eyes. None of the street lights on the block work and it was fully nighttime. Then I could see them. Um, Eric, Dante, and Mo. Uh, those guys who have the street band up on 54th? I think they called them... 
dollop a dozen or something like that. But I was pretty sure there were four of them in the band. Either way, I stared at them for a bit too long, then started to move on, but Mo called out to me, asked me to come over. I hesitated, looking to the store. About another couple minutes shouldn't be a problem. I walked over and started talking to Mo, then the rest of the guys. They were practicing new music. Problem was, their fourth guy, Chris, wasn't there. According to them, Chris doesn't do rehearsals. They wanted to get the new album recorded in like a week so they could perform it on the street and sell it, but as they put it, they needed practice. And Chris plays the steel drums, an instrument Mo knows I worked with in college. They asked me if I could do them a solid and hop in for the night so they could get some practice in. I told them I don't know their music, but they assured me it would be fine. If I know the instrument and Mo knows I do, then I can just follow and play by ear. They pressed again that they really needed to practice. So... I hopped in. Their music is a kind of tropical, chill hop kind of feel to it. Solid stuff. If I had any more spare money, I would have bought a CD off of them. Once the cobwebs were shaken off, then the nerves and the coppers come and deal with noise complaints wore off, I started getting into a flow. Enjoyed myself. It was fun. Like I was on a real stage again. I thought we were making some real solid music, but nobody gathered around on the street. Still, nobody complained either, so we must have been doing well. I was in the flow, wasn't really paying attention. I have no idea how many songs we really did. Maybe ten? Twice? Maybe. Then the jam came to an end. They thanked me for hopping in. I thanked them for having me. I don't know how to put it into words, man. Felt real good after that jam. Better than I have all day. Hell, probably better than I have in a long while. As I stepped out of the garage, I was reminded why I was brought into that in the first place. I told him it must be real annoying dealing with a guy who doesn't do rehearsals. Everyone needs to perform, or at least to feel better. That's what um, Dante spoke up. He shrugged it off, not just because by now they're well aware of his quirks, but because as he put it, he didn't belong here this night. Tonight, I belonged here. Tomorrow, who knows where I belong, but I'll find it all the same. That kind of hit me. After a moment, I thanked him again for the jam. We all said goodnight, and I started moving towards the store. But I quickly sunk into my thoughts. Dante was right. It seemed like the rest agreed. We all gotta find where we belong. Where am I gonna belong tomorrow? I was so lost in the thought, I almost walked right past the corner store. Realizing where I was, I spun towards it. Then I knew I fucked up. The place was dark, definitely closed. I checked my phone, it was half past 10. I checked the store hours they have in the window, 
They're close to nine. Try the door. Close and locked. I press my head on the glass looking inside. All the lights were off. There was no one left in there. Shit. I turned around, looked to the next block over. Could try saws, but that's blocks away and I have no idea what their hours are either. I hung there for a minute or two. Finally decided to just cut my losses and head back. It wasn't hard coming back. Everyone's off the street by now. But I did slow down. Went back to my thoughts. Well, initially. As I was walking back on our side of the street, I saw Vitaly wrapping stuff up and taking it inside. I just waved at him, but he started shouting from across the street. He said he figured out what he would change. He said he just wants a subway station near us so he could visit his friends in Center City more often. That's all he wants. I thanked him for the thought, said goodnight, and went back to my thoughts. This day. I stormed away from that conversation in the morning with Rick because I was pissed. But why? I think I knew it, even when it happened, but I didn't want to face it. The real reason was probably because I was afraid he was right. That I was trapped here. We all are. And that we won't make it anywhere if we stay here. Now, now I know he's wrong. Well, kind of. Rick was always a solo kind of guy, so moving out to the burbs with a widespread and then not knowing his neighbor's name, that place is right for him. Not for me. I prefer this city, a block where everyone knows each other's names, has each other's backs if needed. The burbs is where he belongs, and the city is where I belong, and who knows? Maybe someday Rick will no longer feel like he belongs out there and will come back. Or, heh, <laughs> mm, the opposite for me. Yeah. yeah, we had a bit of a fight today, but if he wants to come back anytime and if he doesn't act like a total dick, I can see hanging out with him again. Like before, if he's up for it. Maybe you will be, maybe you won't. Maybe that time is come and gone. As I got that, accepted that, it's just when I was walking back up to the steps of this place. So, yeah, that was my day. You still didn't get the sour cream. Good thing for you, Mac did. Yeah, but there was some crazy shit that happened on the way there. Oh, really? I want to hear all about that. <laughs>